Andor episode four is out today, and it picks up right where episode three left off, so let's just get into it. Cassian and Luthen escape Ferrix and head for the planet Aldani, where Luthen hopes he can convince his new friend to take part in a job. Andor laughs off any fight against the Empire, thinking it's pointless. I think there's plenty more to learn there, but he mentions being sent to Mimbin after some time in prison to fight against people he would have considered allies until he ran away. It's interesting that he was there during the same year that Solo A Star Wars Story takes place. He and Han may have bumped into each other. I think that was probably purposeful, considering Cassian's story is similar to Han's. We're just gonna see it spread out over more screen time. The transition of a selfish man into a revolutionary willing to give his life for the cause. I don't think that parallel was accidental. But at this point, Cassian is still very driven by money, and Luthen tempts him with 200,000 credits and the promise that he would be risking his life for something that really matters. And then we head to freaking Coruscant and the Imperial Security Bureau headquarters. It is so good to see Coruscant again, and it's wild to see the ISB on screen in such a major way. This organization I've read about for decades, and now here we see its inner workings. But I love Partagaz's speech about what it is that they do. That their goals of security, that the Empire's goals of security and order, and all that stuff they pretend to care so much about is an illusion. No, the ISB simply exists to seek out what they view as sickness. Any threat to the control they have over the galaxy, whether it comes from within their ranks or without, they seek out symptoms of resistance and they eliminate them as fast as possible. The ISB hears of the trouble on Ferrix, they view it as a symptom, and they swiftly move to relieve the Preox Corporation from their place of authority there. Just like the Corpos were spoiling for a fight in the first three episodes, the Empire is always looking for an excuse to seize more control, and the Corpos served up an easy one for them. Back on Aldani, Luthen gives Cassian a down payment in the form of a kyber crystal as a symbol of his promise, but also a demand that it be returned once the mission is complete. He claims the crystal was made in celebration of a victory against Rakatan Invasion, which is a fun little easter egg for Knights of the Old Republic fans, but it's also a symbol of the present day and the fight against Imperial overreach. And I like the idea of Cassian being given an item with connections back to the Jedi and the heroes that no longer exist at at this point in time. With the Jedi gone, normal people have to pick up the fight against darkness. Even if Cassian is taking the job for money at this point, we know where he will eventually end his journey. Outside the ship, Luthen speaks to the leader of the mission, Vel, and this is where things start to get a little dicey for him. I do think he wants Cassian to survive. I think he believes Cassian will survive because he gave him the kyber crystal, but he does seem to be more interested in the success of the mission than the survival of the people. He seems like the we-have-to-win-at-any-cost type of person that probably wouldn't fit into Mon Mothma's official rebel alliance. I don't fully know what to think of him yet. But I think that's the point. We're starting to get into the political spy thriller side of things where we aren't supposed to know who to trust. Vel takes Cassian back to her crew, who are none too happy that they have a new addition, and she's clearly trying to keep Luthen's involvement a secret. To muddy things further, we then follow Luthen back to Coruscant, where he puts on a disguise so he can fit into high society life. Or is this his real identity? I don't know. I'm very intrigued by him. He's got an antiquities shop as some sort of cover, and that's where we finally get to see Mon Mothma. She visits under the guise of wanting a gift for her husband, and this scene has everything. Ancient artifacts to serve as easter eggs? Check. Intense dealings made behind closed doors? Check. Coded messages with veiled threats? Check. I was into the first three episodes of Andor. I think they were important for the character and the overall story, but I was really hoping to get scenes like this in the series, and now we have them, and I think this is just the beginning. Because we head to Mothma's apartment, which is absolutely baller, but we immediately crank up the tension even further because we see that her husband is throwing some party and has invited people like Ars Dangor and Sly Moore. The series makes it clear those names are trouble, but I gasped when I read them. Sly Moore is Emperor Palpatine's chief of staff. She fully knows Palpatine is a Sith Lord and is force sensitive herself. She is the last person Mothma's husband should have invited, but we learn a lot about her husband when he claims those people are fun. 
I was hoping he would be more on Mothma's side of thinking, but he seems like the type to just enjoy his status as a senator's husband while his wife actually tries to improve the galaxy. Genevieve O'Reilly crushes her scenes, and I am so psyched to see her actually getting to sink her teeth into this role. She probably had more screen time in this one episode than all of Rogue One and her deleted Revenge of the Sith scenes combined. I am loving her performance so far. Back with the Imperials, ISB agent Dedra Miro takes a special interest in the box Cassian attempted to sell Luthen in the previous episode. It was stolen from one of her bases, and she believes its theft could be a symptom of a growing rebellion. Partagaz asks for proof, and she has none other than gut instinct, which he quickly dismisses. He waves off her feelings, claiming that the ISB only acts on vetted and verified information. Obviously, facts are important, and they have their place, but The Clone Wars says to ignore your instincts at your peril. I love that the Empire just rolls its eyes at Miro. In so many Star Wars stories, instinct and the Force go hand in hand, and I'm not at all saying Miro is Force-sensitive, but I am saying that the Empire is the complete opposite of anything even resembling a Jedi, which makes sense, but I love that their philosophies are so far in the wrong direction. And keeping things consistent with what we just saw with the Inquisitors and Obi-Wan Kenobi, members of the Empire can only cooperate so much. Competition is encouraged, and Miro's rival very smugly walks out of the room when she doesn't get what she wants. Her position is very similar to Cyril Karn's in the first episode. Something is wrong, a crime has been committed, and nothing is being done about it for bureaucratic reasons. It obviously doesn't sit well with Dedra, and I think she will be seeking out an ally in Karn before too long. And oh, isn't it convenient that the Empire just relocated him to Coruscant. He returns home to his mother, who slaps him and then hugs him and brings him inside. We don't know much about her yet, but in interviews she has been described as a stage mother from hell. I think we'll be getting a lot more insight into why Cyril is the way he is, and I think we'll be seeing him team up with Dedra and return to Ferrix sooner rather than later. To wrap things up, we head back to Aldani one more time to get a sense of what the actual heist is going to look like. Cassian's team is attempting to steal the payroll for an entire Imperial sector, and I've just gotta say I love seeing a job like this being planned with a little scale model and everything, and the detail of the younger guy, Nemec, clearly being in charge of making the model and being very careful with it is nice. I'm instantly afraid for him, especially because he says he has a good feeling about Cassian and thinks he's doing this for idealistic reasons and not money. Nimic feels like a prime target to get killed or hurt during the job, the symbol of good and innocence, someone who stands for something whose death might tragically help Cassian to grow. Their getaway plan does not sound promising, using an old beat-up freighter that can't outrun the TIE fighters that will surely be chasing them, but they're going to use the cover of a natural phenomenon to escape, and that is a very Star Wars thing to do, using elements of the planet that the Empire never cared to fully understand to combat them. The natural world versus the technological world has been a Star Wars theme since day one. I was hoping maybe we'd get to the heist in this episode, but I think it's likely we'll be waiting another two weeks until episode episode 6. If we're following the same format as the first three episodes, we'll get two weeks of build-up, and then the third episode will be the one with all the action. Now that we have to wait week to week, that structure bums me out a little bit. These episodes don't feel fully complete to me. They feel like part of a whole without a solid conclusion. But I can live with that, knowing that's just how the series is. Because, like I said in previous discussions, I have never once been bored watching this show. It's a lot of talking, but it's captivating. I'm excited to see the stakes continue to be raised the way they have been. I like that the first arc started small and away from the Empire, but we're quickly moving more firmly into familiar territory with the Imperials moving in on Ferrix and Cassian getting ready to rob their payroll and Mon Mothma's dinner party with Sly Moore. Man, I really hope Sly is actually in the episode. That will be chilling, and the kind of cameo I think fits perfectly in a political thriller. This show has been handling its fan service very well so far. Nothing too overt, nothing that stops a scene dead in its tracks. Just little things like throwing Starkiller's mask from the Force Unleashed into Luthen's shop, or Mon Mothma's mentioned of Gorman to her husband, but I'll cover that stuff in separate videos. I just want you all to know that I did love having those little moments, and anyone complaining that this show doesn't have enough easter eggs just isn't looking hard enough. 
But that's it for my review. Join us this evening at 6 p.m. Eastern for our live stream after the show where we can talk about all the stuff I didn't have time to cover here. Until then, let me know what you thought of the latest episode in the comments. If you haven't already, please like this video, subscribe to the channel for all our and or coverage, follow us on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram, and consider checking out our Patreon page for our video reactions and audio commentaries for every new episode. And you can check out this playlist for all our existing and or content. As always, thanks for watching, and may the Force be with you.